Mike Douglas is Michigan's retirement coach. Glad to have you here with us alongside Michigan's retirement coach, certified financial planner, Mike Douglas. I'm Heather Branch here asking Mike questions about what, well, what you need to be doing. Perhaps just more importantly, what you need to know about. <laughs> Let's just start at the educational level when it comes to things to think about before you start doing the things you need to be doing as you're getting close to retirement. Perhaps you're already in retirement. A lot of the pressure falls onto us individually, our shoulders. And yeah. so we've been working and saving and suddenly we get to retirement and we're, we somebody hands us a million dollar check and excuse me, am I supposed to know what to do with this? Mm-mm. I've You're been a financial radio, advisor now. I've been a bright radio broadcaster for how, for decades. You expect I failed finance in college. I'm supposed to know what to do with this? No, You're that's like, but that's why, that's why you have I a job. That's why you have a job. Not the captain. I am not the captain of this ship. That's why Mike Douglas is here to help. That's why you have a mm-hmm. job. Certified financial planner. Uh, don't forget that you can go to Michigan's Retirement Coach to learn more and get started on this conversation with Mike and his team. We also have links posted in the show notes. Also, our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that to learn more, hear more from Mike. Just search Michigan's Retirement Smash Coach. Smash that button. Smash, Smash that button. Smash the subscribe button. Smash the like button. That's what the kids are saying these That's days. The Smash that saying. like, subscribe, comment below. Let us hear from you, America and beyond, what you think. That's on the YouTube channel, Michigan's Retirement Coach. All right. I feel like... It makes sense to me that you want to talk about this story because I think you even said in our last podcast recording, if you ask 10 economists where we are economically speaking, you're going to get 10 different answers. Did you not say that? I think verbatim. Uh, we were talking uh, not about that. We were talking specifically know, about annuities inside a retirement plan. Yeah, yeah inside, inside a re- annuities and a retirement plan, that how economists can never agree right. on most things right. except for the fact that for retirees, annuities can make sense. Got it. Okay. Well, so there's one time. There's there's one yeah, time. One time. <laughs> And that's about economists. it. Okay. Well, the question that it has Sounds come, like the start of a joke, like 10 economists walk, walk into, into a your bar. room. <laughs> right. Yeah. The conversation about where we are economically speaking in the way of recession, this is what has rapidly come to the forefront of the conversation, I guess, because of the rattling of chairs and of teeth and accounts that happened a couple weeks ago with Wall Street taking a huge plunge. We've recovered since, but the conversation about recession has come back around. If you ask 10 economists, if we're headed there, you're going to get 10 different answers. Mm-hmm. Most people believe. There are some people who will do things like look at the data from the sales of men's underwear and the sales of women's lipsticks to determine if we're I headed into we a recession. Do. I think we all do in some way or another. Listen, you yeah. know, when you want to know the real state of the world, how is right. Fruit of the Loom doing? How is right. Revlon doing? And that will really tell yeah. you the state of but states. We call it we call it hanging it up. <laughs> we hands it up. Hands it up. What's that mean? Uh, yeah, we're gonna hands it up. What's that mean? <laughs> Let's check on the sale of men's Listen, underwear. You never know where you clearly gonna... an economic indicator that we've all been waiting for we, is the Haynes factor. Uh, Listen, yeah. and what I appreciate it's called the cotton index. We just try, <laughs> we don't discriminate. We, we use all resources here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, for real, for real. I know that you don't take things like men's underwear and lipstick seriously. Although, listen, indicators can come from all different places. So, can we talk about the men's under, like where, like what it means, like yeah. the underlying? Yeah, talk so about it. explain it. it. So, in this article, they do a great job of uh, lining out like the fact that there's discretionary spending that we all do, mm-hmm. and they, it's just kind of funny ones they choose to look at. So, you know, if you're buying men's underwear, if you're willing to spend a little bit more money on men's underwear, you get the Ralph Lauren. Right? My dad likes to yeah. say, "Oh, it's La- Ralph Lauren." Yeah, you jazz it up a little bit, right? You get some some saucy or spicy under a little bit, right? Yeah. Cost a little more money, but you say, hey, you know, hey, I'm feeling hey, good. Hey, Economy's hey. good. Economy's good. I Market's generally check my portfolio. I go say, hey, how's my portfolio? Okay, good. All right. I can then get I'll the Calvin Klein kind of underwear. <laughs> but it's, a, it's an indicator of your comfort with spending on discretionary, yeah. right? Okay. That's what they say with lipstick. Yeah. Um, it's another one like, hey, what quality am I willing to? Am I looking for premium or economy? And that tends to have a direct correlation to, hey, listen, I'm not willing to pay for premium right now. Yeah. Because Things are tight, yeah. but it's just a, uh, a different indicator. Got it. All right. Well, let's talk about indicators that perhaps you just, you take seriously as mm-hmm. a certified financial planner, as a person you, I mean, even if you weren't in this field, I think as a hobby, you would study economics. You just, you're very interested about all this stuff, Mike. So what do you look at? What are the tells that you look for, the metrics that you follow that could have you saying to somebody, yep. Looks like we're headed to a recession. 
Yeah. So there's a couple things. Well, number one, you want to seek the counsel of wise people, right? Sure, sure. So we want to look across the board, right? There's a reason these major, major firms have these huge research teams, mm -hmm, right? Because mm -hmm. their job is to research and predict the future in a way that best protects these major firms. Major firms want to be opportunistic and also hedged and protected against the bad times. So they hire research teams that's full-time job is to protect the firm. So they will do all this research out. Well, uh, it's just so funny. I sat with someone yesterday. She's a client. And as we're going through, she goes, well, we just had a big 401k meeting at the office. And the guy from JP Morgan came in. I thought, wow, that's really cool that they brought in JP Morgan guy. What did he say? She goes, he's telling me that it's less than 25% likely that we're going to have a recession. And I said, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And she goes, yeah. So he goes, so just stay in the stock, stay in the plan. Now they have a bunch of JP Morgan funds inside of it. Right? So they said, stay in the plan. Don't change anything. Uh, hang tight because it's all misleading. Right. Well, then as we sat there, I said, I'm going to show you something that I'm that just uh, August 15th. So, I mean, as of the date of when I met with her, it was August 20th. Uh -huh. So five days prior, JP Morgan's global research team said, basically, we're at the point of 45% likelihood that we are going to have a major recession um, within the next 12 months. Like his own firm right. disagrees with him. He went so from, either he, said, he said 10%? Yeah. And like then 10 the company to, you know, he, he said less than 25, but he said, he said the official statement was less than 25, but he says really it's like 10 to 15. And then the company he works for came out and said at least 45% chance. Yeah. So apparently he had not read that five days prior, his <laughs> right. global research team was much more bearish than he is. Yeah. Um, cool. He probably knows more than all of them. And so that was that's something that comes out. And then there's these different economic trackers you can mm. follow. Um, another one is, and we talked about this uh, on our radio show not too long ago, but generally speaking, 10 quarters after a monetary restriction policy, mm -hmm. um, that's the start of a recession. So in our case, the Fed's raising rates. 10 quarters from the first uh, rate hike would be when you would expect to see a recession begin. Well, that would be the we fourth there? quarter of this year. Okay. So, so yeah. October. We're there. Right, we're coming into it. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing we look at is the fact that consumer credit card spending in America has gone up to 1.3, almost $1.4 trillion. Control. We are out. We have lost our minds. Right. As and a person so, who has credit, a credit card bill that I need to pay right now, mm -hmm. we've lost our minds. Well, and the difference between us and the government is, and I think this is the problem, we, it's not monkey see, monkey do. Right. So monkeys see the government run dead up and just get another credit card mm -hmm. and print more money. Mm -hmm. And it's all politicians. Let's not get ourselves. Every politician spends your money. Just they spend it differently. Yeah. But the consumer can't just do that. There's a ceiling on how much you can throw on credit cards. Right. And you can keep trying to get them, but the, they'll get worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And you stack up to a certain point where you can't there's no more room to go. Mm -hmm. And so what do you have to do? You have to decrease your spending. You have to change your lifestyle. You have to kind of go into debt consolidation and debt cleanup, which means less spending. Mm -hmm. Recessionary tactic. Um, and it can also cause that if all these companies are designed around you spending money to keep them afloat, and then because of your money spending, you have to you hit a debt ceiling, and then you have to decrease your spending, and now they make less money, and it causes layoffs and all these things. It's all directly related. Yeah. At the same time, the Federal Reserve is raising rates with the goal of slowing the economy down and decreasing inflation. Well, and they've been very open. They, to, the way to fight inflation is to increase unemployment rates and to slow down the consumer spending make people stop. because they yeah. can't afford it. Yeah. Right. I mean, and that's kind of what we saw. You know, I just was talking with our team about this the other day. But if you have if the average 401k is five hundred thousand mm dollars. -hmm. And as a result, the average person can leverage that to buy a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar house. Mm -hmm. Like in terms of, it's not a direct ratio, but like let's say that's the thing. I have these assets, and I have this income, and as a result, I can buy this this type of house. Well, then, what happens when the four hundred one k is seven fifty because of a crazy bull run that we had? Mm -hmm. Well, now the average family says, "Well, I can actually leverage up to a five hundred thousand dollar house for the same house." Because we get a pricing war that pushes the houses up. Because now yeah. all of us can afford more. So I say, mm -hmm. well, "I really want that house." So I'll, so I'll say, I'll give, I'll give you 400 for it. And you say, well, I really want that house. It's got a pool, whatever. I'll give you 425 for it. And it run, runs the prices up. Right. So now the floor of the real estate market runs up and there's more buyers. Well, when they raise interest rates, the goal is to say, we're going to make that $500,000 house. It's still 500 grand, but because of interest rates, it's not a $3,000 a month payment. It's a $5,000 a month payment. 
now can you still afford it? And there's that's going to start thinning the herd. And all of a sudden, people can't afford it anymore. And it's an affordability crisis is what we're hearing. Mm-hmm. The Federal Reserve's job is when spending gets out of control mm-hmm. and the markets are too good. I'm going to use good as a term, but like too much. Their job is to rein it in. Their job is to bring it back and to say, hey, listen, we need to slow this down. So we're going to make it harder to afford things. So you guys will get your act together and quit spending like a bunch of drunken sailors on leave. And that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. And so they they do that. On the other hand, when things are really crappy, we come out of the 2008 financial crisis. We come out of 2020 with COVID and the fastest 33% crash in history. Their job is to lower rates, to stimulate the economy, to make things more affordable. As a result, we do it. But they're supposed to ratchet up. Right. But instead, we went super low and stayed there until things got out of control. And now they're sprinting right. them up, right. which is going to cause all these other. So we're getting this whiplash effect. Yeah. And whiplashes hurt people the most in the back seat, not the driver. Right. Mm. It's like, if you want to ride the, the roughest part of a roller coaster, sit in the, in the back. back. Um, when we rented an RV to go camping a couple of years ago, I was driving. I felt fine. My kids in the back started getting sick because uh-huh. of the movement the and they're not used sway, to that. Yeah. This way is way different and it affects those in the back more. So when you think about who's in the back of the economic bus, it's the middle class and the, you know, and, and the, the people who maybe aren't driving so much, but they're more on the receiving end of economics. Yeah. And as a result, that's who really struggles with it. And that's the people who actually, so it's interesting. It's the people with less, but they're the ones who are most dependent on pricing the matter. Yeah. So we're, we're going to see these things come to roost. And we've had a lot of whiplash and a lot of uh, artificial uh, stimulation of the economy to keep things at a controlled rate. And as a result, we're going to have to reconcile that. And that's what a recession is. It's a resetting of segments of the economy, a resetting of certain points to say, we got to get this right. In 2007, 8, 9, the problem with the recession is it's really hard on people, but a good recession resets bad things. It's like breaking a bone so that it's healthier in the long run. In 2007, 8, 9, we reset the housing market. We got rid of subprime mortgages. We tightened up lending policies. We got rid of mortgage-backed securities that are taking bad debt, rolling them into the stocks and selling them off to people. And then when the mortgages go bad, the, all the, the banks close up and then the investors who invest in the mortgage-backed securities close up and you have this major catastrophe. A lot of corrections but at least happened though. It re- oh yeah, yeah, we got rid of the Bernie, like Bernie Madoff got busted in the same time frame. Mm-hmm. So we tightened up how investors are able to invest for uh, clients. We tightened up how money's allowed to be exchanged from person to person. We tightened up who can get a mortgage. So those are good resets. Yeah. Well, recently we've had corrections, but no reset. Right. Right. We're going to, we're coming along and we're going pretty well. And then 2020 COVID happens, 33% crash. But yet by the end of the year, the market was positive 16%. Mm-hmm. We didn't fix anything. Mm-hmm. Nothing right. Changed, yeah. These tech companies made a ton of money, sprinted down, and then they made even more money. The and they ran up yeah. through 2021. And then here comes 2022. And we correct, but we don't reset. Right. We go from five companies in 2021, five companies controlled 25% of the movements of the market. And you go, oh, that's crazy. Well, then we have this major reset. Netflix loses 60%. Disney's down 80%, all these things. And then 2023, we say, oh, it's not five companies, it's seven. The Magnificent Seven are now running the whole market. And yep. they're having a 25 to 30% influence on the entire market. Yep. And that's crazy. And so we've not reset any of that yet. And when was, that, so when, when, is 2008 the last really reset where things were changed? It, was, it, it sucked while you were in it, but a lot of it came out of it. it was, is 2008, 9, 10, that space, the last time this, that really happened? Yeah. Well, because if you think about it, in 2008, we had a real estate reset. So what yeah. happened? We started adjusting. We tightened up policies. We made it harder to get a house. And then for a while, they said, all right, we're going to start lowering interest rates. So over the really through the teens and into the late teens and early 20s, they started lowering rates, lowering rates, lowering rates, getting down to a very low number. And eventually uh, we got to the point of two and a half to three percent mortgages. That's crazy low. It is very yeah. enjoyable. But that's not sustainable. Right. So then they they should have raised it up sooner. And if they raised it up sooner, we would have gotten to a better place. So as a result, that's kind of where we're at. And so now for people, when they're trying to build a retirement plan, when they're trying to build a life, yeah. and you say, what do we need to do in a recession? I always say there's kind of big three things you need to do. You need to really, really stare down the barrel of your expenses and yeah. minimize your discretionary spending like luxury underwear. Right. Uh, minimize those type of spending. And lipstick. Luxury. Uh, not just not just the men's underwear, but underwear, the women's no lipstick. more Chanel lipstick for you ladies. Right. And what's interesting, another one they said in that article, it's not a, it's not a luxury spend, but they said, look at the number of uniform patches being printed. Right. Because think about the type of job that would have a uniform patch like 
like a plumber Mike, right or, right there yeah. right it's trades yeah it's it's um blue collar work mostly yeah um it's it's those type of service work got it the reason they have to buy so many patches is because they're hiring so many new people if uniform patches are down new hires in those type of jobs are down are down and that's tough mm. and so there's another old rule of look at the highway if you look at the highway and you see, is there a lot of transportation? Are semi trucks coming and going? Well, then that means manufacturing and industry is up. Um, if you see a slowdown in transportation, that's an indicator that companies are spending less. You also look at the layoffs. Intel just said that they're going to lay off 15,000 people. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest chip manufacturers in the world is going to lay off 15,000 people. Yeah. Google is right sizing and they're bringing people back in because of the term you'll hear. When you hear right sizing, it means layoffs. Got it. Um, because in growth model, you over hire because you're thinking we're going to grow. And we're going to hire as many people as we need to hit the growth numbers. Yeah. And then a recession model, they right size back down to sustain numbers. So these are things we're looking at. So minimize your discretionary spending and tighten up your expenses. The second thing is raise your cash position. Find ways to have access to cash and great, whether that's, again, please don't, this is not a specific, like, there's no endorsement here, right? But you may want to consider finding a line of credit, not a loan where you actually get the cash, but a line of credit where you can access more money if you need it. If you are on the back end of a right sizing, and you you get let go, not because you did anything wrong, but because they're right sizing a company and you don't have you haven't raised your cash. You haven't got your three to six months savings. You haven't uh, d reduced your expenses and you happen to have this line of credit that's out there for one hundred thousand dollars. Well, then you can tap into that as needed as you as you right size your family. Right. To adjust to the new thing until you get a new job. But sometimes these recessions, we think of it as like a six month or recessions can go as long as five to seven years. Mm hmm. So what if we go through a five to seven year slump as baby boomers pull money out of the economy to set themselves up better and all these things? So there's a lot that goes into it. Can happen, yeah. yeah. And then the last thing is to de-risk your future portfolio. If you're a retiree, if you're a younger person, buy, 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 stay in the market. But as you're getting older, you need to de-risk your future uh, opportunities. So that those are the things we need to do. Um, there's a lot that goes into it and yeah. right sizing for each family and preparing for each family looks different. We had this whole staff meeting the other day talking about each person. Like, hey, here's what we're doing to right size our family in preparation for whatever recessions come to make sure that if it's bad, we're ready. If it's good, we're still opportunistic. So um, that's what you need to do. You need to prepare that way. On our website, michigansretirementcoach.com, there's a button that says start your retirement roadmap today. If you click that button, we will have that conversation with you to explain how to recession-proof your family, how to rece recession-proof your retirement, how to build a plan that makes the most sense. But understand the economic indicators that speak multiple, multiple, multiple sources, wisdom in the counsel of many. Multiple sources say within a year, hmm. more than 50% likelihood we're having a recession. Hmm. And most likely it is not six months. It's multiple years. Got it. We have to be prepared. Yeah. It's like literally seeing that this storm is coming. There's a tornado coming towards. I mean, we went through that here in mid Michigan a couple of years ago. Pretty nasty tornado went through Williamson, Weberville, a couple other cities. Yeah. And if you know it's coming, yeah. can you batten down the hatches? Yeah. Can you prepare? Can you Don't reinforce be afraid, the levees? Be prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Do all the things, you know. Um, and so if it doesn't happen, okay. Well, we were safe. Right. If it does happen and you're unprepared, it's better to be prepared and not need it than unprepared to need it. Right. So that's what we're talking about. Michigansretirementcoach.com. Start your retirement roadmap today, and we'll have that conversation to make sure you're recession-proof in your retirement. We also have links posted in the show notes, so you can just click there or, again, find us anytime at michigansretirementcoach.com. Thanks for listening to Michigan's Retirement Coach with Mike Douglas. To learn more, visit mylifeplanfinancial.com. Michael Douglas is an investment advisor representative of Stewards Wealth Planning, LLC, a registered investment advisor. Financial professionals are not licensed in all 50 states. To find out if Michael Douglas is licensed in your state, please call 517-323-7526. Stewards Wealth Planning, LLC is not affiliated with nor endorsed by the Social Security Administration or any other government agency and does not provide legal or tax advice. Annuity guarantees rely solely on the financial strength and claims paying ability of the issuing insurance company. By contacting us, you may be provided with information about insurance and annuity products offered through Michael B. Douglas, NP. And number 9650939.